at this time, we're, we're going to go ahead and move on to the second lecture, which is on computer aided instruction. Okay, lecture number 22 was on computer aided instruction. And I think the overall theme for this one was something we heard, we've heard Hamming say a couple of times, which is what you learn from others you can use to follow and what you learn for yourself you can use to lead. And as Hamming looks at computer aided instruction in the year 1993, one of the things he looks at is, um, he looks at it from two perspectives. One is training and the other is education. If you can skip to slide five for me, please. He cautions, before he begins the discussion, he cautions the students and kind of demonstrates to the students this idea of the Hawthorne effect. Which is, we have to be very careful with computer aided instruction technologies because there's the potential that just because it is new and it's proposed to the students as a new technology, that it'll automatically improve performance because it's a new idea. It shows that someone cares and is trying to, you know, from their perspective, improve the education they're receiving and that performance might actually improve, but it only lasts until it becomes the norm. And so the best way, according to Hamming, to teach is to actually change the way you teach constantly. And that's not something we often see in, in education. A lot of times, because once we kind of create, it takes a lot of work to create lecture materials. Once those lecture materials are created, we want to be able to just use them over and over and over again, and not necessarily have to change them or update them very often. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so he really looked at, you know, can we use computers to speed up or make easier or help learning in any way? One way that computers have been used is as an automatic grader. This is something that teachers today still look for. You know, is there a way to use the computer to grade programs or grade exams and do a comparison of expected output to actual output? And what Hamming found was that these things get created, but they're not necessarily maintained. You know, and so once that person moves on, the next person doesn't pick it up or, or it's hard to maintain. And then, and so he states that the subconscious realization is maybe that machine learning lacks something. There's, there's a reason that while some people might find it beneficial to use a grading program, the next person that comes along isn't interested in maintaining or isn't able to maintain it or something is lacking. And next slide. And I, he says, and, and one of the things he points out then is that what's lacking really is the socialization aspect. It's the, the, the humanity is left out of the equation when computers are used. One of the important things that Hamming says, you know, is part of the educational experience is learning how to get along with people, learning how to work together, learning how to respect other people's ideas, learning to adjust to different methods of teaching, different professors. And, and so education must have this human contact. And I think in our, in our business, you know, especially in the military, that's really true because you're always have, you always have to sell your ideas to your subordinates, your peers, and your superiors. And so you, you need this socialization aspect as it relates to education. Can you jump to slide nine? Um, yeah, so one of the examples of CAI that Hamming brings up is this idea of a program book. And, and I actually have a program book. Um, it's called Armor Attacks, and it is an interactive experience 
in small unit tactics and leadership, right? So you read chapter one and you make a decision and then you jump to chapter 12 and you find out if that decision you made was right or wrong and you go through the whole book this way. And what Hamming said, that good students will give wrong answer just to see what the book will say, I think I did the right? So I did that time and time again when I read this book because I wanted to know what the bad decisions were. What, what are the bad leadership decisions just as much as what are the right ones, right? And so this was interesting because he, he, he talks about, you know, even though this is a computer-aided instruction lecture, he talks about this book because we were trying to do the same thing with CDs. And in fact, the military has some training that I've taken on, you know, online where you pick choices and it gives you, at the end, it tells you if you were right or wrong. The problem is, one of the major problems of this is now you have no way to backtrack and figure out when you learn something. So what leadership lesson did I learn and when did I learn it? I'll never be able to find it again in this book. And the same thing with the, at least with computers, you can track the answers the student gave and kind of do some analysis like that. But there's little to no evidence that this sort of learning method actually works, or, or at least at the time that Hamming was talking about it, there was little to no evidence. Next slide, please. Computers are best, in Hamming's opinion, for teaching the mechanical tasks, or more specifically, teaching the rote learning tasks, or those that need to be ingrained in a student. So multiplication tables, the student can practice those. It's just base math, basic math, and the student can practice them over and over again. Student really doesn't need a lot of feedback except you got it right or you got it wrong. Also, you know, another idea here is this, uh, the idea that they needed, you know, pilots maybe when they get trained because they have to learn to do things instinctively they have to have a computer-aided training would work for them because they that helps them to be intuitive and in fact i will just kind of jump over here for a minute in the interim and on the next lecture here real quick down here i posted a link to this this was just from last week where the Thunderbirds flew over Los Angeles and the number six pilot had to pull up very fast because the number three pilot had, had moved into his, into his airspace. And so to avoid the collision, he made that instinctive reaction that Hemming talks about. And so I've attached that just as an idea of these conditioned responses that you need when there's in fact training. Hamming discusses education as a system. You know, in the example he gives is when he's talking to the provost and he, you know, says the standards for my class is that, you know, the students have to lift 250 pounds to graduate, but that is just too hard of a standard for most students. They get discouraged, they've dropped my class, they don't want to take it. But instead, he says, if we make the requirement to lift 125 pounds twice, they're still meeting the overall objective, which is they've lifted 250 pounds. The results are not the same. The students aren't as strong, which I, I love this analogy because that's really the idea with education, right? We wanna, we wanna make students who are strong and can solve hard problems. If we make problems easier, uh, the students get the desired result of being able to pass the class, but do they actually learn how to learn for themselves? And that was Hamming's point, is that there's, there's some, some goodness in pushing students and making them work hard and learn hard. Now, students might also, on the, on the flip side of this, say, yes, but if, you know, all five professors that I have do this, I have no life, right? So, <laughs> so it, there's, there's kind of a delicate balance as we uh, talk about education as a system. Next slide, please.
Okay, and, and once again, you know, that which you learn from others, you can use to follow. That which you learn for yourself, you can use to lead. Hemming also points out that, you know, there's also a, a, a discussion of, well, you know, if you do computer-aided instruction, students can learn things at their own pace. And Hemming's counterpoint to that is, but don't we want people to be able to think quickly? right, especially leaders in the military, you know, would you rather have a person who is a slow learner working for you or a fast learner, right? And so there's some goodness in making students learn rapidly. And then compounding the problem at the very end is this idea of what is an educated person? And Hamming states that in, you know, an educated person in 2020 is not the same will not be the same as an educated person in, you know, the same definition in 1995, you know, and so if you can jump just to slide 16, we'll wrap it up. So Hamming concludes that he believes that computer aided instruction aids in training, but there's no proof at that time that it aids in educating. Where, and he defines and says specifically, training is when you're teaching a conditioned response. It has a task, it has a condition, it has a standard. Every time it is performed, the task is the same, the conditions are the same, and the standards are the same, right? Whereas education is a higher level of thinking. It's, it's this idea of, and you're not educating people for today, you're not educating them so that they can you know come back and tell you what they memorized last night you're educating them so down the road five years ten years whatever it might be they can apply the things they have learned to other situations using the patterns and the tools that they've developed hamming's course called learning to learn is designed to educate and so let's go then to the questions that I have on this page, okay? Which once again is centered around this theme that what you learn from others you can use to follow and what you learn for yourself you can use to lead. The, the questions specifically are, do we think the differences between training and education are easier or harder to differentiate today than they were in 1995. And if so, how so? I also kind of wonder and ask, how does the availability of the MOOCs, the massive open online courses and other online learning platforms affect this answer? Where is the balance between learning for yourself and learning from others? Right, because I, you know, as a lifelong learner, that's one of the things that I really enjoy doing is I really enjoy going on Coursera and taking courses and expanding my knowledge base. Um, so that is computer aided instruction and, and it, you know, it, it does not have that social interaction that Hammond says must be there. Um, but I think there's some value in that. And so I'd be interested in your thoughts. And then the kind of future question is, if we push forward another 25 years, what would an educated person look like in the year 2055? What will be the role of educational institutions in 2055? And what is the role of the individual in his or her own education in the year 2055? Um, so I'll give you a couple minutes to think about that. I will post this in the chat. And and we'll go around the room. Just uh, point out, because Hamming would, oh, 25 years from now, that's when you folks are the chief of staff of the Army, the chief of naval operations, or the leader of your next institution. So this is, these aren't just theoretical questions, but it's who are you and where are you going and how are you helping others? in that role of what you want to be. 
25 years down the road, hopefully I will be retired as a full bird. <laughs> but you may not be sitting at home, Toby. I had a mentor. His, his slogan was, my wife married me for life, not for lunch. Get out of the house. <laughs> Get back to work. I'll, I'll, as another one of the older, or the oldest person here, I'll be 74 in October, and I started working when I was 16 for others, and stopped working for others, except my wife, when I hit 68. I don't know how I ever ran a 300-person group at a company my last four years, and accomplished the things that I'm doing at home tonight. You'll always work your life. If, especially if you do what you love, that it's not work. It's just You just get paid less as you get older. I'd like to, Michelle, hitchhike. Uh, this is out of my book, which, by the way, Don, if everyone makes sure they get you to me, your snail mail address, next month I'd like to send out a copy of book, Richard Wesley Hamming, Man, Mathematician, and Mentor to everyone in the class. And so I need a mailing address to send it, please. There's a line I put in the book. And until someone helps me and finds a source, at the moment, I think it's my quote. A mentor or a professor prepares the student for the question not yet asked. I think that's sum summarizing, summarizing what you're doing. It's not the answers in the book. There are no questions in a t most college books, not Hammings, but most of them are exercises, especially if there's an instructor manual. Prepare for the question. And I, ha I once had a student, graduated the Naval Academy, and I was teaching at Marymount University in Arlington. And the student complained because the following question was not in the book. The question was, Compare and contrast, this was a second level graduate course. Compare and contrast the techniques of chapter one and the techniques of chapter three to the following hypothetical problem. The student complained to me and the dean to say, the answer to that question is not in the book. And I responded was, well, how many employers are gonna pay you much money to give an answer that's in a book? for your thoughts. Marty, out. I have a very mean comment to this too. I think most classes at NPS are exactly the way Marty just told us. You, you, you just learn basic things for your professor and he asks basic questions in the, in the exam and you just have to throw up knowledge and put it on paper and only very little, a little amount of professors, a small amount of professors is able to put out questions. One of them is Emila. Um, we had for 3D devices and she literally came up with four questions and you had one hour to write and yep, just put in all your knowledge you have and adopt it or apply it to a problem. Oh, my monitors went out. Okay. <laughs> and I think um, coming back to uh, Michelle's question in the chat, um, the, the problem is between training and education that most of the, the time we are at NPS is training. One of our Marines in our cohort just uh, stated last week, the master at NPS is like a bachelor on steroids. Uh, you don't have any times for two years and after two years you graduate with a master and you said, okay, how did I achieve this? So there is no time for creative thinking. Um, all of your schedules are pretty much full, at least for, for the MOVE students. Um, you have about 20, 25 hours a week. And uh, normally the professor expects you to, to work twice as much to prepare everything before class and after class. But it, it's a kind of education. It's, it's worth it. And uh, you don't, you're not allowed to get lazy. Otherwise, we call it the, the wave will come over you and you won't be, handled to, uh, you won't be able to handle the workload uh, anymore. So... I, I don't need an answer for that. Just, just a mean comment. 
I, not so much as an, an answer, but it, it reflects a little bit towards some of what Marty said and some of what you said, Toby, is that most of the classes that you're taking at MPS aren't really graduate courses yet. Probably a little bit more than half are still effectively undergrad classes that were delivering because most of the section weren't those undergrads before. So, you know, maybe six or eight of the classes that you're taking are actually real grad courses where the professor can actually start making you think about wild and wacky things. And all these other courses are their education, but they're, they are a lot closer to training because they're learning all the karate kid stuff, all the wax on, wax off. These, these are just all the techniques and the knowledge bits that you have to have in order to put together later. Or if you like the newer karate kid, it's jacket on, jacket off. You know, there's, there's a certain amount of knowledge that has to be instinctualized. And it's still knowledge. It's not, it's not the same thing as training. And we've got a really weird job here because we don't have undergrad classes where they're full of undergrads. And if you took the class as a grad student, you know you're in an undergrad class because it's all the undergrads. We, we just don't have those. So we, we kind of mix those things, but it's all about getting you to your six or eight classes that are really kind of final preps for you to go off and do your thesis. So most of what you're doing, yeah, it, it's going to seem fairly constricted, but you have to start someplace. Any other thoughts from anyone? Uh, this is Marty. I have a question rather than an answer. Assuming what you just stated is true and that most of the other people on the Zoom would agree, why is it that way and would you change it? I'm talking about many of the courses might be considered senior undergraduate courses and only say eight are your master's courses? Well, I started with a rec services major in one of my refresher computer science courses, trying to teach computer architecture to a jet that was a rec services major in college. It wasn't their choice to come to MPS. It was their detailer told them, you're going to NPS or I'm going to send you to a really crappy place because I have to fill my block. Now that's not the typical interaction, but there are more of those than any of us would necessarily like. I've had the Marine music major, you know, great guy, a major, but he was a music major. He, you know, he, he didn't have a strong, what we would call computer science technical background and he rolls into computer science. Without those entry level undergrad courses, those people have no hope. And to put the actual actionable reality to that data, the Navy gave Carnegie Mellon $10 million to run 20 students a year for five years through an undergrad CS matrix or not undergrad, through a uh, graduate CS program. And in the third year, the Navy canceled the program because Carnegie Mellon had accepted seven students over three years. Everybody else they said was, oh, uh, not prepared, we're not taking them as students. So NPS does have that very special place in academia where you can take anybody who has a will to succeed. And we have the experience to how to help anybody with a will get through. But the price of that is somewhere between half and two thirds of what you're taking isn't really graduate level thought, it's prep. So, hasten to add that we have some very strong coursing functions. Some are regular at MPS. All the majors are accredited. Another is the majority of majors 
are doing individual theses. Pretty hard to hide the math. Others are group projects where they're intentionally working on synergistic approaches to larger problems by multiple individuals. Given the range of experience, it's not just that some people have less qualification than others coming in, but some are highly, sometimes overqualified. And how do you teach across that range of student experience? Boy, that's, that's really interesting. And most of the courses, even the ones that are on the books as undergrad, there's, there's a portion of them, I don't know, 15% maybe, they're taught at a level that stimulates up and above. They're taught at a level that is not just checking boxes, but putting students at the place where they really can leapfrog. So I think what, what gets even further interesting then in the questions you've posed, Michelle, is, well, here we are just a couple of months into getting slammed by pandemic. And everybody's working at home. And this this course was supposed to be us sitting around on a Friday afternoon, you know, with our cups of coffee and going, well, yeah, you know. Oh, wow. Uh, here we are, much of it self-driven, self-educated. And that's not just us. It's everybody at the university. Oh, but it's not just everybody at the university. It's the Army. It's the Marine Corps. It's the police. I got told yesterday afternoon, unsurprisingly, oh, yeah, if uh, some of you folks come down to San Diego to go on that ex experiment, a float experiment next uh, fall, mm, don't forget you need two weeks uh, self-quarantine in the hotel down here. Uh, which is probably the exact same requirement right now for most nations on Earth, even if they let you in, if we're going to travel around. And let's see, we have two international folks. So will you folks be quarantining when you get back home? Bert, Toby? There's still no decision on that. Um, ah, worst case, no decision. The at usual the moment, they're lifting the restrictions. Um, so for people coming to Germany from inside the European Union, there is no quarantine uh, required by now. And uh, on the federal level, there is an exemption for military personnel coming back from missions abroad from deployments. But um, our time in Monterey is not considered as a deployment as it. Um, so even if we have something on the federal level, we don't have anything on the state level now. So. Very confusing. Great. They come to the bureaucracy. Great. So, uh, so situation normal uh, military environment. No decision. You own it. Make something happen. Okay. You all are used to that. Oh, but wait. What about all your people? And I'm looking, what is the role of the individual in his, her own education? Okay. All of your people are now self-quarantining before they relieve the other team. What are they doing? And you can't just say, well, we'll all get together in the big tent because if one person's sick, then the rest of the team's sick and you can't leave. And now you, oh, so how, you say a fifth or sixth time, what is the role of the individual in his, her own education? And in case that seems boring in your next job, in your next team, Everybody's life depends on that and depends on each other. How do you measure that when they're all sitting in hotel rooms for two weeks? It's because they have to. Marty, are you talking? I'm muted. Back in the Neanderthal period, when I went to Drexel and graduated in 1969 in electrical engineering, I went to work and then started part-time to get my master's in electrical engineering at the University of Connecticut, Go Huskies. Because of an excellent undergraduate in electrical engineering, it only required, it's normally 12 courses for a master's degree if you 
least back then. I ran out of courses to take after eight, and they gave me a mini thesis, and I got my master's in 73. So education following education is the eight graduate courses you're talking about for masters at NPS. I did the same thing in 73. I went to the Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island for 12 months, had extensive courses in national security management and strategy, and that was all new to me. That was an epiphany. But all the courses were at the graduate level because over half the students had a master's degree already, and the others were high achievers to get selected for the command and staff course. When I came to Monterey, well, back then in 77, when I arrived, I was again majoring in electrical engineering. So you th might think it might have been lighter. No, I had 15 courses to do in three quarters if I wanted to start my research. Because unlike some of you, I was only given a 12-month fellowship to Monterey. It was extended by three, but I finished all my courses in nine months. And those of you who say it takes all your time, yeah, it took all my time. Fortunately, I was not married when I was out in Monterey. And I lived in Herman Hall and would get up, eat, go to my office, take courses, study, 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 maybe have lunch, maybe not, have a bite to eat, come back, work, go home, shower, change, collapse, repeat for 15 months. It's as hard as the hardest job I've ever had. 70 hours a week is what it takes to succeed in this world, not 40 you think Elon Musk works 40 hours a week? You think Bill Gates? You think Professor Don Bressman works 40 hours a week? Marty out. Uh, we used to call 12 hour workday uh, half days. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, um, everyone, we're a little over halfway through. So Thank you very much for your thoughts. I want to remind everybody to go to the lesson 22 page at the bottom and, and leave these thoughts in the comments as well. You can answer my questions or as we have in this discussion, pose, pose your own questions. But uh, let's take a short break. Donna, I'll turn it back to you for the break. Thank you.